So, have you ever wondered how I record all my piano videos? Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another video on this channel. And today we are doing something slightly different. I'm going to be explaining and showing you all the equipment and basically the behind the scenes process to why I set up to record the way I do and how I set up to record the way I do to get the video and the audio that I want. And hopefully my process will give you some ideas for yours in order to help you figure out how you want to record your own piano and get it to look and sound good. So of course I get this question with some regularity, especially with my background in audio engineering, like why, how do you record your piano? Why, what do I need to record a piano? My grand at home, my upright at home. And I think most people ask this question expecting professional level results for a budget price, which is what we all want. Be that as it may, today at the very least, I want to give you an understanding of where my setup is at so that you can temper your expectations and see what parts you can improve on your setup or maybe parts that you can downgrade from mine in order to still get the sound that you want. Uh, this video is structured in such a way that I'm talking about the video component first and then the audio. Most people want to get to the audio component, but since we're recording for YouTube, we can't quite forget the video aspect of it. Since this video is just a cursory overview and a bird's eye view of my setup and what my process is like, I'm not going to go into extreme detail on how I use each piece of equipment, nor am I gonna provide alternatives. So if you would like to see any detailed breakdowns, any budget gear reviews, any sort of or even more expensive gear reviews, let me know down in the comment section below what I should review, what I should take a look at, and how I can best help you, especially if you have questions on setting up. And of course, I need to throw this disclaimer out there. This is not a sponsored video. Everything that I use in this video are things that I have had to get myself or that I'm borrowing from someone else uh, and things that I personally believe in and have used before. Of course, everything is linked down in the description below. So if you wanna check anything out that I talk about, they're all down there for you. So with all that being said, let's get right to the video. First things first, let's talk about lighting. I feel like lighting gets glossed over by a lot of people because we want to talk about cameras and other stuff, but I really do think that bad lighting can break a shot much faster than a bad camera can, at least in my limited experience. And when I first started off, I used one light and that was a garage light kind of propped up at the top of a lamp. That was kind of interesting because it gave for a really what we call hard light and it looked kind of harsh to my eye at least. I know some of you guys preferred that, but personally, I really didn't like that. So these days I use three lights. So the first light that I'm using is a GVM 80 watt light. And what it does, it's my main light. So it's the brightest light that lights up the main part of my shot that you probably associate with my videos the most. And it's attached on a soft box so that it diffuses slightly and goes over a larger area. So it's not quite as harsh. And as you can see in the footage, the difference between not having a main light and having a main light is quite literally night and day. Now this is the most important light that is in this setup. And if this is the only light that you can get, I would recommend that you get a good main light. Now, the second light that I have is to light up the shot from my left hand. On the main camera, this is just a fill light, but on my left hand camera, it becomes the main light. It doesn't have to be as bright as the main light, but it has to provide some sort of fill so that my left hand isn't in entire shadow. If you look at the video clips, you can see the difference that having a second light makes. You can also see the difference in the main camera as well, how the keyboard becomes a little bit more filled in, how it becomes a little bit more lit up, and you can see a little bit more clearly. Previously, before I got the GVM light, I only had two soft boxes and they were by a brand called Walkfly, but they're really just like one of your budget Amazon brands. Two soft boxes for like 70, 80 bucks is pretty decent, I think, for the consistency and the lighting that they give. But the main reason why I ended up upgrading to a bigger light for my main light is because you can even see in some of my older videos, it gets a little bit washed out, is a little bit duller. And that's why I think some people prefer the harder light because it really did illuminate my back a lot more. But now, because I have the GVM light, I use my second walk fly to be my last fill light. Now this one is just to light up where my piano strings are and where the hammers are. Yeah, as you can see in both videos, uh, it, it makes a bit of a difference. It makes it a little bit more even and gives the lighting a little more flattering of a shadow. So there isn't just a big drop off. Before I had this light, uh, I used a whole bunch of other things. I tried a cheap LED panel. I tried a cheap ring light that I had lying around, but a soft box really is best, I think, for this application. So that's lighting. And lighting, I think, is most of the battle when it comes to getting a good video shot. Now second, let's talk about cameras. So I started off on 
This beefy boy, a Nikon D7100, because I didn't have a camera to start. But someone in my family who was a photography buff was kind enough to let me borrow his DSLR, which is what this is, a photography camera. And so I shot basically all of my first videos on this camera, the main angle at least, coming down from the side. At the time too, I was shooting with a GoPro and sometimes with my phone to get the other side angles. These days, however, I use this. This is a Nikon D3400. It is much smaller, it's an older model, so you can get it for cheaper too. I don't exactly know how much nowadays, but this is just the base model with the kit lens. And it's got less features, right? But you don't really need them, again, with good lighting, I think. You just need to know how to set your exposure, and it looks pretty decent. Now, you may have noticed that these don't exactly have a flip-out screen, so it makes it quite difficult to tell what shot you're getting, especially since I like to manual focus on the letters of the keyboard, so on Yamaha. So what I do, much like what I do for streaming, is I have one of these, a video capture card. It's like 18 bucks on Amazon. You used to have to buy an Elgato like, capture card, and it would cost you like 100 bucks or something, but these days, these $18 ones, $15 ones are pretty good. And so I just paired both of them up. I'm recording with my laptop anyways. I stick it into my laptop and I, while sitting at the piano, I get to see what shot I'm getting. Very handy and would recommend if you don't have a camera that has a flip out screen or if you need a monitor, but you don't want to buy a camera monitor that costs hundreds of dollars. Now the second camera that I use to get the side angle is my Canon M50. The Canon M50, I unfortunately cannot show you right now because it is the camera that I'm shooting this video on. So you are looking at me through the lens of the Canon M50. It's got a great color science too. It's pretty easy to use. With applications like this, the autofocus is incredibly easy to use too. So all around, it was a really great bang for your buck sort of thing. It's also light, it's mirrorless, and it feels great. I also stream with the Canon M50. That's my main camera that I use to stream with. And I also teach on the Canon M50 over Zoom. So again, I'm getting a lot of utility out of the Canon M50, so it's hard for me not to recommend it. It doesn't have a clean HDMI out if that's something that you're looking for, but the EOS webcam utility is okay at what it's doing. And for now, I'm happy enough to use it for streaming, for teaching, yada, yada. Now, let's get on to what everybody's waiting for, the audio. Let's get it. Now, I'll admit that for a recording piano, I am probably less picky than your pro recording engineer is going to be. But there's a good reason for this, right? As a pianist and as someone recording, I enjoy utilizing my skills as an audio engineer and I enjoy applying that craft. But when I'm playing piano, I am also a pianist. And those are things that I don't need the extra 1% difference in sound quality in when I'm getting ready to play, when I'm getting ready to perform. Take that for what it is. I hopefully it will provide compelling reasons for why my sound sounds the way that it does. And if you know what you're talking about, about, you feel free to flame me in the comments down below. But I, overall, I think I don't get a bad sound, so I don't know what you would be trashing me about. So first and foremost, let's talk about the interface. I record via a USB interface because I only have a laptop that takes USB input. This might be a surprise to a lot of people. I use a Behringer UMC 404 HD. A Behringer? I would have said the same thing a few years ago. In fact, I would have said the same thing six months ago. At first, I bought this interface because I needed to get my Focusrite Scarlett 18i8 fixed because there was a problem with the power supply. And if you were on that stream, you'll remember. It was pretty disastrous because the stream crashed like three times because the power supply was going out. So I bought this to hold me over in the interim and I was surprised at how good it sounds. I suppose the Midas preamps are pretty good. I've used Midas boards live before and they always sound great. And so I guess Midas putting some preamps in Behringer now that they're the parent company, uh, it was good stuff. But be that as it may, the noise floor on the Behringer is I think according to some tests, uh, pretty high, right? It's not great. But for the signal to noise ratio that you're getting from recording piano because you're sticking the mics right up to the strings and your grand piano or even your vertical piano is very loud, I guarantee you, you're not gonna hear that, right? In fact, I almost need to turn on the pads for this uh, when I'm recording using a sensitive mic like a small diaphragm condenser. So there's very little chance that we're gonna be hearing lots of that noise floor. In fact, if you listen to my recordings, you probably can't hear it at all. This preamp is kind of light, right? Which is handy. And it only comes in at about 150 bucks. This is probably the cheapest four input interface that I would recommend to really anyone. Anything below this, it'll actually start like 
th those problems I talked about will probably actually become apparent. If you are so inclined, you can begin to build a studio around this. You could attach your studio monitors or you could hook up to other places or you could do a whole sort of other things. But you know, for recording piano, all you need is these four inputs. In fact, the setup that I'm showing you today only requires the two, but it's expandable, which is why I prefer having a four input interface, right? Because someday I may have two more mics and stereo, so then I could take the recording even further and have room mics as well as my main two mics. And the four inputs allows me to do that. But wait, hold up a second. What? If you have the Scarlett 18i8, why don't you just use the Scarlett 18i8? Well, I prefer having the Scarlett 18 IA here at my desk setup. Having to move it a lot, it gets a little bit uh, tedious when I'm trying to record. Again, this comes back to the difference between audio engineer and pianist. As a pianist, I want to play, I want to be a musician, and I don't want to have to worry too much about the audio engineering things, even though the audio engineering things also has its own artistic side to it. But it's a different side to it, so I don't want to worry about that too much. And having to transport and set things up for hours and hours before I record, it's just a hassle. I just like having that down by my piano at all times ready to go so that I can record whenever I want to. Which brings me to the next thing that we need, which is an XLR cable. Woo! XLR cables. Uh, XLR cables attach your mic to your interface. I know a lot of people don't know this, which is why I'm including this in the video, right? You see this, these inputs here, right? These inputs on the Behringer, they are not normal inputs, right? They are not USB inputs. In fact, it is a USB out, but these are not USB inputs. And so in order to hook your mic up, you need one of these XLR cables and they go straight in. Boom, just like that. Now on the other side of your mic, you stick the three pins on the other side of the mic into the three holes and boom. People are always on Amazon looking for the cheapest XLR cables. And if you read the reviews on all these cables, they end up being quite varied. The only ones that are safe bets for sure are like your Mogami Golds, who, which are very expensive and everything else. It's like not exactly a shot in the dark, but eh. One budget brand that I do recommend above others typically is Hosa. Sometimes I'll recommend Cable Matters, which are all the cables that I have right now. Sometimes I recommend Monoprice. But the real message that I have for everyone about XLR cables as a live sound engineer who's had to deal with cables being thrown everywhere, cables that don't work, is that if you treat your cables nicely, they'll probably last longer than you think. If you want to trash your cables and put them in wet places and you want to step on them a whole punch, then expect them to not last very long. You get like an okay priced cable, so like 10 to 30 dollars for like six to 20 feet sort of deal, you're probably going to be fine, right? You're probably going to be fine if you treat your cables well. And worst comes to worst, if you buy a cheap cable and it breaks on you, well, you can just buy another one. Which brings us to our next item, the most exciting item that everyone wants to know, which is the mics. Ooh, upside down. I use the SE8s in stereo pair. SE8 by SE Electronics are, yes, we have one, uh, small diaphragm condensers that are quite a bang for the buck, actually, I, I in my opinion. Like, I, I like these so much that right now, it, for this video, I'm recording my voice on an SE8, which is why I don't have the other one, because it's up here. But what do you get? You get a nice little small diaphragm condenser that's hand designed apparently, a windscreen, and not only that, but you also get a stereo bar, a stereo bar that I don't use because I set my mics in a space pair configuration over my strings. Now, why do I mic my piano space pair instead of XY, which would then require the use of a stereo bar? Well, if you listen to more traditional classical recordings, you'll actually find that most of them are either mic'd XY, right at the, the bend, or mic'd on top off the lid. Because for classical recordings, recordings, you want to hear the natural reflection off the lid because that's how the audience hears it. But if you haven't noticed, I'm also in the any piano space and what do people love in any piano? Wide stereo, left, right. That in combination with the fact that my room is kind of small and doesn't sound great with reverberations, I want to mic kind of close to the strings right on top of them so that I can get the nuances of the hammer striking the string a little bit and also a bit of a spread in the left, right sound stage. It's still stereo when you mic XY, but it's narrower than if you put space pair over, over top of the strings. I put all my mics pointed towards the hammers and really for 500 bucks to get two, two of these mics and this thing, I think it's quite worth it. And they are incredibly flat. This, these mics actually shock me with how flat they are. So the SE8s, highly recommend. They are $500, but they get you a very nice stereo sound and a very nice stereo pair. I expect that mics will probably be the one thing that you guys will request me to review the most. So I will prepare myself for that. Now, the last thing that we have to talk about, mic stands. Well, 
People like to race to the bottom for these too, because people want the cheapest mic stand that money can buy, and then they get upset when it breaks. For what it's worth in the past, I've used Amazon Basics, Samson, and on-stage mic stands, which are all under $30. Like those are the three brands that I see recommended a lot under $30 that I have used. And other stuff above like K&M comes in around like 50 bucks, which I have not purchased myself. All the ones that I have now are Amazon Basics. Now I've done a lot of live sound stuff where I had to use the same equipment over and over again and transport them a lot. And the ones that always inevitably fell apart were the on-stage ones and the Samson ones. I don't know if it were the models that I had, maybe they were older, maybe I, we didn't take as good care of them, but the Amazon Basics ones were the ones that always stood the test, which is why I only have Amazon Basics now for cheap mic stands until I can invest in some more expensive ones. In fact, shocker, the current mic stand that I'm using to record my audio right here is an Amazon Basics mic stand. So again, not sponsored, but really recommend them if you're looking for a cheap budget mic stand. The only thing that might be a slight issue is that the mic stand is an eighth inch uh, screw. Now they come with three eighth inch adapters, which they didn't use to before, I don't think. But also if you're buying the SE mic, they come with the included adapter as well. So you're covered on all bases there. But anyways, that about does it for this video. Thank you for listening to me rant about equipment because I am a gearhead at the end of the day, which is why I'm a audio engineer because you know, I love gear. Hopefully this was somewhat informative to you. I am trying out different setups. I do have more equipment that I'm trying to test out. Big thanks to everybody who watches these videos and supports me on Patreon, have donated on streams. All those things help me improve my setup so that I can give back to you by making a better product. And if in that process, I get to share some of this knowledge with you, then it's all the better for both of us. If you have any questions on setup, on how to record, on cameras, lighting, anything, be sure to either hit me up in the comments down below and someone will answer your question or find me in my Discord server. Link for that is down below as well. And there are dedicated channels to actually talking about this. If you'd like to support the channel or get more content, you can feel free to check out my Patreon or buy me a coffee or by getting Wacky's merch. And if you are interested in anything that I talked about today, be sure to check out the links down in the description. If you'd like to hear me do some piano analysis, you should click right here. Or if you'd like to hear this whole setup in action with me playing, you click right here. And until next time, everybody, peace.